Now, very quickly here, uh, it says if a person suffered a traumatic incident and then got saved sometime later and then forgave the perpetrator, would the person still need deliverance? Yes, usually, right? Uh, Remember this. Generally speaking, well, people ask me, what's the best method for healing or best method for this or that? Now, it's very simple. The method you believe in is the method that will work for you, right? There's no one method that Jesus gave. Now, the, the closest he gave was in Mark 16 where he said, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That's the standard. But <clears throat> what you'll find, I, I go to some places in the States and in some places when I start to cast out a devil, I will tell them, okay, oh, this is a spirit. We're going to take care of this. We're going to cast this out. And then as I start to cast it out, it's funny because they will start doing things a certain way. And then I can stop and say, you're, you're from this area, aren't you? And they'd say, yeah. And the reason I know that is because I know that area is known for when you start to cast out devils, how they believe devils leave, so they start doing it that way, right? Now, that doesn't mean that's the way devils leave. It just means that's what they've been taught, which doesn't mean devils won't leave that way. I'm just saying, though, that the, you have to realize sometimes the way things happen is because that's the way people have been taught they happen, right? Now, that doesn't mean it's just psychosomatic. Sometimes that's the way it works. Now, we are spirit, soul, and body, and we're all tied together. God doesn't mind you being emotional. He doesn't mind you uh, bringing these other aspects in. He expects you to worship him with your spirit, soul, and body. And so there is this thing. It doesn't make it wrong to do it a certain way. It's what makes it wrong is when you start saying this is the way it has to be done. You understand? That's when you get over legalism. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to healing, okay, it is right to live in forgiveness. Right? So you should forgive whether healing was connected to it or not. Right? You don't forgive to get healed because if you did then you're not really forgiving you're just trying to get healed so what I'm trying to get across is that there's not really biblically, biblically speaking there's not a lot tied to forgiveness and healing okay I, kn I know you've been taught that at times in different things but <clears throat> just because you've been taught it doesn't mean it's right okay and so now it's right to, to forgive and Forgiveness does release you. And forgiveness a lot of times is for you more than it is the other person. And you can forgive someone and it'll release you. But it's because you've been taught that. Right? There is a spiritual aspect to it. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying understand that forgiving somebody isn't going to get you healed just because in the spirit realm, forgiveness is tied to healing. Okay? It's not in the spirit realm. It's in the soulish realm where you have tied forgiveness to healing. You understand? And you can still get healed. So <clears throat> I'm just trying to show you that I just want to stick with the Bible and what the Bible says about it. I mean, I believe that, <clears throat> you know, you can tell, I could tell you, you know, do this and you'll get healed. And you would if you'd believe it and do it. Even though the Bible doesn't say to do it. But it's because you believe it. See, God answers your faith. And if you believe it, then you'll get it. So if I can convince you that God said right now to do this and you'll get healed, you'd do it and you'd get healed because you believed. God would meet your faith. But that doesn't mean that what I tell you would be right. You understand? All it means is you believed. See, I'm really trying to teach you to, to think biblically as opposed to thinking, you know, religiously. Right? So, if the Bible works, the more accurate we get with the Bible, the better it will work. So, the idea is to strip away all the stuff that's not biblical. Now, for instance, here's a good one. What are your, your views on fasting? Okay? Particularly when Jesus spoke about this kind being removed by prayer and fasting. All right, that's a good, good question. It always comes up. Now, in Matthew chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, it speaks about this, and that's the reference that they're talking about. And in that situation, the man brought his son to Jesus' disciples, and they tried to cast the devil out, and they couldn't. And then Jesus said, bring the boy to me. And he scolded them and said, you know, 
you unbelieving generation, how long do I have to put up with you? Well, that's pretty rough, you know? I mean, these people, they tried, but they didn't get it done. Now, this is Matthew 17, but in Matthew 9 and 10, Jesus had already told them, you go heal the sick and cast out devils. That's why he got on to them, was because he'd already told them to do it, and here they were, and they had gone out and done it, and come back and said, man, even the devils are subject to us through your name. So they had success. So now the fact that they're not getting success, you'll notice they didn't progress upwards, they regressed. Matter of fact, if you look at Peter's life, it actually got worse as he went along. It didn't get better. He started out pretty good, right? And ended up pretty bad, okay? I mean, until the very end anyway. And so, I mean, started up, you know, he's the one that acknowledges Jesus as the Christ and all this stuff. I mean, it's really pretty good and then ends up, you know, can't get this boy delivered and Jesus scolds them because of their unbelief and then <clears throat> he denies Jesus three times. I mean, there's, come on. It, it just progressively got worse. So he's not really the best example of somebody you want to follow as far as how their faith operated. But now, but you got to admit, he did walk on water. Right? So until you walk on water, I wouldn't criticize him. <laughs> okay? Now, but when it comes to fasting, <clears throat> we were talking about this, actually, we'll go at supper too, is that, it's funny, we're talking about fasting at supper. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> fasting usually is used by people to try to twist God's arm and get him to do something. And it's, it's basically used like a child uses a temper tantrum. Right? In other words, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to starve myself and I'm not going to eat until you give me what I want. And that doesn't work. Okay, fasting is a discipline that does not move God. Okay, it moves you. It disciplines you. It kills your flesh. It kills you and helps you die to the flesh and die to self so that you can focus on the things of the Spirit and it helps you keep your body under so that your body doesn't control you. You control it. All right? Now, as far as power, <clears throat> now if you read Matthew 17... It says, how be it this kind goeth not forth but by prayer and fasting, at least in the King James. <clears throat> when it says that, you'll notice if, if your Bible has it in there, it should be in italics because that is not in the original Greek, right? It's not there. Now, it is recorded later in Mark, but Mark actually got his gospel through Matthew, and so he recorded most, a lot of the pieces that Matthew did and got some of it from there. Now, here's the thing. If you, <clears throat> there are times whenever the, especially the King James translators would put words in to try to help you figure things out. And you can usually tell when it was divine and when it wasn't. But if you look, the best way to do things, uh, let me just, let me give you an example. Take your Bible and go to Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> let me give you an example real quick. Now this is, I usually include this, so I'm not bunny trailing off or something because of the, the question. <coughs> In Mark 16, we're going to start about, let's see, about verse 15. No, let me see. Uh, let's go down to about verse, well, I might as well start in verse 20. Yep. Mm, yep, verse 20. Mark 16, 20. Now, you know Jesus has already risen from the dead. He's appearing to the twelve. And he's telling them to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, all that, okay? And then it says, he was received up into heaven. Then in verse 20 it says, and they went forth, talking about the, specifically the twelve he was referring to there, and preached everywhere, and I'm going to read it the way it is exactly written here in the King James. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Okay, now, <clears throat> go back and read that again because this time I'm going to read it the way it is written in the Greek, but I'll read it in English. Okay, it says this. Now, you'll notice the word them is not, the word them there is in italics, which means it's not in the Greek. Okay, now, and the translators put it there to try to help us. But sometimes they didn't help us when they did that. They actually hurt us. Okay? So you, when you see the italics words, you should always read it both ways 
and see what fits into the context and what fits into the, the message of the Bible, basically. Okay? So, first off, it says, They preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. But if you read it the way it's written, it says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and confirming the word. So he wasn't working with them. He was working with the word. You understand? He worked with the word and confirmed the word. See, our problem is we think God confirms men. God didn't confirm men. God confirms his word. He didn't confirm the apostles. He confirms his word. He works with his word. We were talking about this also. Uh, talking about T.L. Osborne. <clears throat> Years ago, he was on a platform and they were at a pastor's conference and the pastors were saying they needed more power and they needed to do this and all these things and they were going after all kinds of stuff and he was caught on tape actually remarking to a man sitting next to him and said they keep saying they want more power and really all they need is more gospel. Well, why? Because Romans says that the gospel is the power of God. See, that's a, I don't know why the church has gotten like this. Maybe it's this microwave age where we want everything, you know, done, snap, give it to me, hand it to me, that kind of thing. I don't know. <clears throat> but you don't need anointings. You don't need impartations. You don't need to stand in line and get hands laid on you to get what I got or what anybody else has got because if you got the Spirit of God, you got what we got, right? What you, if you're lacking in power, it's not power you're lacking, it's gospel, you understand? It's, it's the word of God that you're lacking. Because God works with and confirms the word. So if you want more confirmation taking place, get more word. Isn't this simple? So when you realize this, then you start. I was driving down the road in Dallas one day. And just driving to, and again, God, when God starts repeating something over and over again, it's usually meaning listen, right? Trying to get something across. And he kept saying, saying confirming the word. Confirming the word, confirming the word. And, you know, I, I, okay, Lord, I know what you mean. That's Mark 16, 20. I know, confirming the word sounds fun. But I don't get it. What are you trying to get across? He said, confirming the word. I said, okay. He said, so if you want more miracles, you want more signs, get the word more accurate. God can't confirm a half lie. See, if God is confirming a half truth, then he is confirming a half lie. You understand what I mean by that? So if you want more confirmation, get have less of your own words and have more of his. The more of your words you have, the more likely you are to get it wrong. The more of his words you have, the more likely you are to get it right. Right? Just the law of averages would work in your favor. Okay? And so if you just say what he said, then he will confirm his word. He's not confirming you. You know, you say, well, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, I'm a... Okay. He doesn't confirm apostles and prophets. He confirms his word. See, all these things that we have about the fivefold ministry, we look at that as though they are here, here, here. No, no, no. It is, they are believers who fulfill the role of a prophet, who fulfill the role of an apostle. You understand? It, it's, not, it's not like we get promoted to that. I mean, see, to be, it's like being in the military. A general is still a soldier. All a general has People say, well, he's got more authority. No, 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 see, you're looking wrong. It's not the authority he has more of, it's more responsibility. And because of responsibility, he has authority. See, you have authority over your child because you take responsibility for them. And when you quit taking responsibility, the state will take away your authority. Is that right? So if you want authority, it's real easy. Just take responsibility. When you take responsibility, you will be given authority. You can't take authority. You have to be given authority. You understand? But you can take responsibility. And when you take responsibility, then re authority is given because you cannot have responsibility without the authority to do the responsibility. Right? Everybody wants authority. Get, all you got to do is take responsibility. But nobody wants to take responsibility. They just want the authority. Because responsibility makes you responsible, but authority gets you, you get to throw your weight around and be somebody. You see? But if you really want to have authority, you've got to take responsibility. Jesus said, look, it's not going to be among you like it is among the Gentiles where you lord over one another. 
we're not to lord over one another. We're to serve one another. And if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of God, it's simple. Be the servant of all. See, when Jesus said that, look, Jesus didn't say, look, now, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, well, shame on you, you dirty dog, you. Why would you want to be great? He didn't say that. He said, you want to be great? I'll tell you how to be great. Serve. He's not against you being great. He's against you being Lord over others. You understand? He has no problem with you being great. He wants you to be great because the greater you are, the more you will serve and the more people you'll help, which means the more responsibility you take, which means the more authority you get. And it's simple. So basically, God has put all this in your court. It's in your, it's in your court. It's up to you to say, I will do that. And then you just move forward. Now, <clears throat> we were talking about John Alexander Dowie. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he was actually, at one point from here, he came from Scotland, but he was here, or he was from here, and then he went to Scotland too. And uh, <clears throat> pastored churches in Adelaide and here near Melbourne and all, all through the area. And he went to the United States. And, <clears throat> they, and he was the man that really introduced healing back into the church in a large way. Tremendous miracles. And they went to him one time. This is before toward, well, this is early in his life. And they went to him and said, do you think, because he was so amazing that he was like the first modern apostle that they had seen in the church in several hundred years. And so they were really amazed at what was going on and they asked him, they said, do you, do you think you might be an apostle? Because this is back before they thought apostles might still be out there. And he said, do, do you think you might be an apostle? And he stopped and he said, he thought it for a minute and he said, I might be if I can ever get small enough. You, you understand that? You see what that means? Now, is, he didn't say if I ever get strong enough or big enough or powerful enough or smart enough or anything else. He said, if I can ever get small enough. Well, see, that's why most people don't walk in anything is because they don't want to get small. They want to be somebody. You know, and, and the idea is not to be somebody. The idea is to step back and let people see Jesus and then just let Jesus live through. Now, I'm not talking about the false humility of, oh, no, would you don't leave. I'm not talking about that. I know who I am. I know my job. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know my calling. I walk in that calling. Uh, you know, I, I don't make apologies for it. But at the same time, I also know there's a different. Now, understand, you see me behind the pulpit and you talk to me anywhere else, I'm exactly the same. I, you know, I, I really, if I'm not, it's not because I'm not trying to be, all right? I, I don't believe in a pulpit persona and, and, and a, you know, s private persona. I don't believe in that. I believe that you minister out of who you are and you ought to be the same person in the pulpit that you are out of the pulpit. Amen? You ought to be the same way, talk the same way, act, all that kind of stuff. Now, the only difference is when, I, when I'm behind the pulpit, I can be a little more direct and in some cases even you might think a little more mean because if I'm riding with you in a car, I can't be as direct because if I say it that blunt, you'll know I'm talking to you. <laughs> right? And you might take offense. But I can talk the way behind the pulpit because everybody's sitting there going, yeah, you know he's talking to you, don't you? That's, that's, that's you, you know? I mean, I know, I see the wives kind of like, you know, I'll say something, they're like, yeah, you get that? He's, that's, that's you, you know? So, but I can be more direct here because with the more people, it, it, it lightens it. You understand? But the thing is, I know my calling, I know what I'm doing, I know... I know what I know. I'm not going to make apology and act like I don't know something if I know it, right? And so I, I'm not going to come across, well, well, you know, what I think, it may be like this, but you, no, if I'm, if I'm right, I know I'm right, I'll tell you, this is true, this is right, there, you know, check it out. At the same time, I also know there's a difference between my office and me. Do you understand what I mean by that? Now, understand, I'm the same person in and out, and I walk in my office, I walk in my calling, but I understand that what God has called me to do, I believe with all my heart that it is vitally important to the church. I believe it is, it's important, it's, it, it's good, it's strong. You know, understand, I understand, but I also separate it in the sense that God needs this message, and he needs it brought to the church. But I also understand that he wants the message out there. He, he's not confirming me. He's not, he's, not trying to, he's not trying to build me up. He's not trying to build a ministry up. He's building the kingdom. 
And so I understand the difference. I understand my authority in the kingdom of God. I understand my position in the kingdom of God. But at the same time, I also know that anybody, that, that if I don't fulfill this, he will get somebody else to do it. So in that case, I, I, I am dispensable. You understand? I'm not indispensable. Now, the message I'm bringing, the, the, the truth of the gospel, the, the revelation that we're bringing back to the church, that is indispensable. But that's why, I, now I believe every man should embody and personify what he preaches. But I also know that the message is sacred. But I'm not. You know what I mean? In other words, any one of you can step into this place and do what I'm doing. Why? Because whatever I do, I'm doing by the Spirit of God. And if you have the Spirit of God, you could do it. Right? Now, I'm thankful that God has called me to do it. This is, there, there is no better life. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. And if you ever step out and start doing it, you'll see. You'll see how easy it is and you'll see how good it is. Amen? So, don't just attend, oh, you know, I wish I could be like, no, you can. That's, that, I'm not doing anything that anybody else is really not called to do. You understand? It's just, I fulfill it a certain way. If you did it, you might do it a little bit different, but it still it would still have to be the same message, right? See, we have to remember our message is sacred, but our methods are not, right? The message is sacred. Our methods are not. Our methods change with the generation. That's why our music changes. That's a method, right? The way you do certain things, is, is it'll change, but the message has to be sacred. It has to be kept pure. That's one of the reasons why it's been... I personally haven't connected with a lot of the other major healing ministries is because a lot of them have been a lot bigger than us. And when you bring a message into a bigger ministry, it gets swallowed up, then it gets watered down, and then it disappears. And so I asked God, because I wanted to connect. But he said, no, you stay separate until the message is well known enough so that it can survive being connected with other ministries. Because this message, I have people all the time say, we would like to take this and do this, and we could do it this way, but we want to do this. And I, and I tell them, will, will you keep the message pure? Well, no, because, you know, we, we have this part here. We got, no, then I won't do it. I would rather stay smaller, or whatever you want to call it, than to somehow pollute the message. The message must be pure. Amen? Amen. And that's why I'm, I'm big on these things. People say, well, we want to add this in, add that in. No, no, you won't do it. If you're going to do it and you're going to call it the DHT or you're going to call it J.G. Lim or John J. Lake Minister or anything like that, it's got to be pure. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about pure like Curry Blake says pure. I'm talking about pure word. Right? You get that? This one is so important because the purer we get it, the better it works. So I'm still refining some things and it's working better and better. So anyway, <clears throat> but now notice when he says that working with them, the them is not there. So he was working with and confirming the word. What you need is more word. Get the word more accurate and he can confirm more. Okay? Now that takes us back to Matthew 17. And let's go there real quick. <clears throat> Matthew 17. And I want to prove to you here. Technically, <clears throat> Jesus didn't say this at this point. Even though, because it is in italics. But in Matthew 17, verses 20 and 21, <clears throat> it says... In verse 20, Jesus said unto them, or let's go back up. Uh, might as well start in verse 14, <clears throat> where he started. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. Now, just as a point of reference there, notice he says, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, and oft times he falls into the fire and oft into the water. Now, notice he's asking for mercy because his son is lunatic. Right? Now, he's not wanting mercy. We think of mercy like forgiveness of sin or something like that. But that's not what he's asking for. He's asking for mercy, but he's wanting healing. Right? And many times you read, you'll see the, the blind men said, <clears throat> Lord, have mercy on us, our son of David. Right? Well, again, they were calling for mercy, but they understood if we get mercy, we get healed. So mercy represented healing. Surely, goodness and mercy will do what? Follow me all the days of my life. So you ought to be healed all the days of your life. Right? So you can start putting these things together and see how they work. Now, he says in verse 16, And I brought <clears throat> him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, 
How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Now, it says from that very hour. Now, it, it does mean instantly, but literally within the hour. Okay? So it might have taken an hour before there was any change. Many times you have to realize all of Jesus' healings weren't instant. Over and over again it says, and the child began to amend from that hour. So healing can be a process, right? Now it can be short. It can, usually it's kind of funny because we use words real loosely. <clears throat> but if, when, a lot of times when something happens instantly, we call it a miracle, and it's actually just an instant healing. A, a miracle literally is, <clears throat> when it, especially when it talks about workings of miracles, there's no such thing as a gift of miracles. It's the gift of the working of miracles. So if you have a gift that includes miracles, what you have is a gift to work miracles. All right? That, in other words, if you're going to have a gift to work in miracles, that means you're going to have to do something to make it work. Remember when he grabbed the man by the right hand and pulled him up? That was a working of miracles. Technically, that's the way it would work. Now, the gift of faith just stands there and says, watch, and it happens. But the working of miracles means you have to do it. That's why you don't see it much in church because people are afraid to actually do something. They'd rather stand back and watch God do it because then they're not responsible. Right? You, you understand? Just trying to be real straight here. <clears throat> now, he says, a child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, why could we not, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus, now, you understand what they're saying is, okay, why could we not cast this devil out? Is that what he said? Okay. Now, he's going to answer. Jesus said unto them, because, because of what? Because, what, what is he saying because for? Because they couldn't cast the devil out. And he's going to tell them why, right? Because of your unbelief. End of story. Not because of their not fasting. Because of their unbelief. You understand that? That's what he said. He didn't say because you didn't fast. He said because of your unbelief. Now later he says, <clears throat> For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, now, what do we say the grain of mustard seed was? The smallest of all seeds. So, in other words, he says, if you have any faith at all, smallest faith you can possibly have, anything less than that, you don't have any. Okay? He said, but if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you shall, not you might, you shall. So, if you have faith, you shall speak. You understand? If you're not speaking, you have not faith. We, having the same spirit of faith, speak. You understand? So speaking and faith is tied together. You can't have faith and not have speaking. Okay? <clears throat> As a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain. Notice, you shall not say unto God. You shall say unto this mountain. You're going to talk to the problem, not to the God. So you need to talk to the problem about God. You don't need to talk to God about the problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's a backwards church. We always want to talk to God about the problem. Now, he says, remove hence, and this is what you're going to say. You notice he didn't say, Lord, please remove this mountain. He said, you're going to talk to this mountain. If you have faith, if you have the smallest amount of faith, you're going to say to this mountain, move. Remove ye hence, right? Remove hence to yonder place. In other words, mountain, get out of my way and move. If you have faith, you're going to talk, okay? And it shall remove. And nothing, now, now notice, get this, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, who is he talking to? Highly spiritually developed, highly developed spiritual people? Or just people with faith the size of a grain of mustard? You know? Well, how much faith does it take to get healed? Well, first off, well, I will, don't, doesn't it take great faith? No, Jesus only told two people they had great faith. One was a Roman centurion who wasn't even in the covenant and had no relationship with God. And the other was a Syrophoenician woman which wasn't Jewish and had no relationship with God. Right? So basically, now think about this. <clears throat> if, uh, what's the guy's name? I heard it last night. The guy over the oil, uh, ooh, I almost had it. Um, something other, <laughs> yeah, I almost had it. Uh, he just had a big problem with the big oil thing. He just sold all the oil to China. 
something like, or coal, coal to China. Is it coal? Something like that. He was the rich, he's the richest man in Australia. That's it. Yeah, yeah. forest, yeah. <clears throat> now, okay, let's say, because in America we have, you know, our own rich people there too. So I'm trying to use your guy, okay? <clears throat> yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to use yours. I couldn't remember his name. But now, let's say I, I want here, I come into Australia and I want to do a good work here. I want to help people. I'm a preacher. I want to help people. And I want to do some good. So I find out about this man, Forrest, and I say, okay, uh, I want to go talk to him. He's the richest man in Australia. He ought to have some extra money, right? He ought to have a little extra. He could do away with some of it. It wouldn't hurt him, right? So I want to go to him and talk to him. So I'm sitting in his office, and I'm waiting to speak with him. They say, do you want to speak with us? Yeah, I want to talk to him. Okay, you'll go in next. And I walk in there, and I say, Mr. Forrest, hi, my name is Curry Blake. I just want you to know that uh, I'm a preacher. I'm here to help Australia and help Australians. I know you want to help Australians, so let's work together. I need about $10 million. Just hand me $10 million, and I will, you know, take off across Australia, and we'll do something here. Now, the first thing he's going to say is, do I know you? <laughs> You're not my aunt so-and-so's daughter's kid, are you? I'm going to say, no, no, that's not, no, we've never met, and I'm not kin. Okay. No, I don't think I'll help you, right? He could say that. Or I could say, well, well no, wait a minute, before you make it, no, really, I really think you ought to help me. And maybe he'll stand there and look at me and go, I'm going to help you. All right, all right. He said, tell him, I'll tell him to write you a check. You'll have it when you leave. I'll give you a check, 10 million. I, all right, praise God. Okay, we'll see it. I walk out the door. <clears throat> let's say he has a son. I don't know if he has a son, but let's say he has a son. And his son comes in and says, Dad, we're trying to finish up this project. Remember the one you started out there? Okay, I'm going to need $10 million for that project to finish this up. Okay, he's going to say, you're going to need 10 million? Okay, writes the check, right? And he gives him the check. He goes and does it. Now, let me ask you this. <clears throat> Who had to have more faith to get the 10 million? Me or his son? Why? No relationship. Isn't that right? Yeah. So the son, it shouldn't require near the faith of the son that it does out of somebody that has no relationship. Right? A son ought to be able to walk in and need this. He goes, okay, why? Because we're, we're, he's related, right? He, and he knows the project. It's part of his project. He's doing his father's work. Shouldn't take much to get much out of the father if you're doing the father's work. Right? Shouldn't take a whole lot of faith. So if you're going to have great faith, so if we're going to look at people with great faith and honor them, then really if you want great faith, I got news for you, you're too late. <clears throat> you, you had the opportunity to have great faith before you got saved. <laughs> right? Because that was the greatest faith you could ever have is for an unsaved person to trust in God to get saved. But now that you're saved, you don't need great faith. Matter of fact, why do we think we need great faith? He said if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, he didn't say if you had great faith. He, now notice, we, we look at this a lot of times and say, oh, great faith. Oh, look, he told us, I've not found such great faith. No, not in all of Israel. Oh, that's awesome. Wouldn't you like to have faith like that? Yeah, I understand that. But bottom line is, those people needed great faith. They had no relationship. They had no right to ask. And they, so obviously they would need great faith. But honestly, you don't need great faith. Why? Because you have a relationship. You can trust in him. Great. See, a great, let me tell you this. <clears throat> Think about this. <clears throat> a person comes in, comes up here, gets saved, comes down front, kneels down. You hear him pray the prayer. He gets up, I'm saved. I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. And then you say, okay, well, here's, here's our new brother. Everybody says, oh, praise God. And then he turns around and says, you know, I just want you all to know, I gave my life to God tonight, and I want to thank you for it because I just got out of prison. And I, the reason I was in prison was I, I, I killed a person and robbed their house. And I just want you to know, though, I just thank you that y'all had church tonight so I can get saved. And I'm saved. And I just want you to know that I've served my time as a murderer and a robber, but I'm saved. And then we say, that's awesome. He said, now, here, the problem is <clears throat> I don't have a place to stay. <laughs> now, I need somebody here to let me come home and stay at your house. <laughs> now, right then, you're going to say, I don't know if I have that much faith. 
right? Why? Because this is a robber and a murderer. The last people he stayed with, he killed them and robbed them. <laughs> right? Now, you'd think it might take a little bit of faith for a person to let them stay. Why? Because they know how bad this person's been. Take some faith. But when you know how good God has been, why would it take any faith at all, hardly? I mean, just that much hard to do it, don't you think? Doesn't need a whole lot of faith. Faith is whenever you don't know, you can trust somebody, right? You, 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 you put faith in them going, I don't know, I'm just going to, I'm taking, basically when you say you're having faith in person, you say, I'm taking a chance on you. Isn't that right? Well, isn't that what you're telling God? Well, you know, I'm going to have faith in God. I'm taking a chance that your word is true. But come on, does it, is it really that big a chance? We're talking about God here. See, so I don't know why we've gotten away from this. We think it, we use faith like a, a currency rather than realizing who we're talking about. God, it, it is God's pleasure to give you the kingdom. You don't have to pull it out of him. He said he wants to give it to you. He said the kingdom of God is within you. He's given it into you. Why? Because with Jesus, if he gave you Jesus, will he not with Jesus give you everything else? Right? Now, that doesn't mean that when he gave you Jesus, because he gave you Jesus, now he'll give you this, and tomorrow he'll give you this. And you, no, no, no. When you got Jesus, you got it all. At the time you got him. Why? Because you have access to everything. You mean? When you, when you get a bank account, and they give you that ATM card, you don't, you're not holding any cash, but you got access to every bit of it. Isn't that right? That's who you are. That's who your father is. This thing about, well, how much faith? I don't know if I have enough faith. But come on. That's insulting to God. You don't have, know if you have enough faith that you can trust him? Has he been that dishonest to you? Has he ever let you down? Has he, has he done all these things to where you, I don't know if I can trust him? Because all faith is is trust. And if you can trust anybody, you can trust God. Amen? Amen? The, the, see, the question is really not, can you trust God? It's can he trust you? Because, see, the bad part is he'll see it through to the end. The problem is he can't find people that will see it through to the end. He finds people that stop halfway through. He finds people that go for a little while and then just stop. Why? Because they have little faith. Their faith stops. In other words, they're, 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 they're weak, basically, is what it comes down to. Now, notice what he says here. In Mark, or I'm sorry, Matthew 17. <clears throat> because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now notice, it doesn't say if you have great faith, nothing's impossible. Let, let, me, just, let me just kill this thing right now, okay? For some reason, well, it's because we've been taught it. The Bible's pretty simple. You have to be taught it wrong to believe it wrong. Okay, it, you automatically believe God if you're born again. You have to be taught wrong. Unfortunately, we've had help over years to be taught wrong. Now, first off, when we read in the Bible, Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Instantly, we got this doctrine of quantity. According to your faith. We think that means is according to how much faith you have. That's not what he's saying. Jesus, when Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, right then he totally blocked out forever faith as a quantity. Because if he said, you can move the biggest mountain with the smallest faith, then quantity of faith never has anything to do with it. Yeah. Right? So when we read, according to your faith be it done unto you, he's not saying according to how much faith you have, that's how much healing you get. He was saying, according as you have believed. In other words, what you just said, I grant it. That's all he's saying. He wasn't saying depending on how much you have. See, again, the backwards church. Jesus said, if you have faith aside of a grain of mustard seed, you can command the mountain to be removed and the mountain will go. But the church has said, if you have faith the size of a mountain, you can command a tumor the size of a mustard seed to go and it'll go. <laughs> See, we've done just the opposite. We don't have to have a bunch of faith just to move this little tumor. It just takes a little bit of faith, and the way you have a little bit of faith, you say. Amen? Because the kingdom is like a seed. Everything starts small. Nothing smaller than a thought. Nothing smaller than a word. But as you speak it, it starts to take effect. Amen? You just sow the seed, and it starts to grow. <clears throat> you can put a seed under concrete, and it'll lift the concrete. 
You ever seen that? It'll start to break through concrete. And you know, and you know what's different about it? It's different. Here's the deal. The reason it breaks through is because concrete is dead and life will always beat death. Concrete isn't living. A seed is alive. Concrete isn't doing anything. It's just sitting there trying to block the seed. But the seed always grows. It never stops growing. Now, let me throw this in here. When you sow a seed, we started talking about this the other night. We didn't get over into it far enough. But when you sow the seed of the Word of God and it goes in. Now, in Texas, we grow something called pinto beans. You know what pinto beans are? Okay. Didn't know if y'all had them here or not. I hadn't seen them, so I didn't know. But you plant pinto beans, and if you plant them about three inches underground, it'll take you about a week to 14 days before you start seeing it start to come up, and it'll kind of come up a little bit, and then it'll, once it gets the, the bean part up, it'll kind of pop up there, right? But it starts growing, and it'll start to break through the ground. But that's three inches in about two weeks, roughly, okay? Now, <clears throat> if I plant that seed then I can know if I plant at the right depth in about two weeks, I can see something, right? But let's say I plant that seed three inches. I've done everything right. I, go, I plant a good seed three inches underground, and then I go to my house and I sleep. And that night, somebody comes running into my field and brings a bucket of dirt. And they pour dirt over that right where I planted that seed. So now instead of three inches, now I planted it three inches. But now I've got a foot of dirt. Now, in two weeks, am I still going to see it? No, why? Because it's got more dirt to go through, right? Now, in two weeks, will it have grown up to the three inches? Yeah, yeah. why? Because that's what it does. It had nothing's changed. It's incorruptible. It'll do what it's supposed to do, right? But if I keep putting dirt on it, it can be growing, and I'll never see it, right? right. Now, so the key is not to add more dirt, but to keep the dirt off of it up to the three inches. In other words, plant it in good soil, water it and all that kind of stuff, but let it grow, but don't let any more dirt get dumped on it. Now, if I let more dirt get dumped on it, it's not stopping the seed from growing. It's just stopping me from seeing it. The seed's still growing. Is that right? Yeah. So when you plant the seed of the Word of God, now, what is the seed of the Word? Well, it's the seed of words. Amen? I mean, you got to admit, these are words. You're right? This is a book. It's made up of words. Right? So you're planting the seed of words. It just so happens that these are divine words. Right? So if you're planting seeds of words, then how do you make, how, do you, how would you water a seed that you're planting? With words. And so as you plant these seeds, and then you water these seeds, and you speak on these things, now how would you put dirt on it? If you're not going to water it, and you're going to put dirt on it, how would you do that? Words. But the difference is, instead of speaking words about the fact that it's growing, you'd be speaking words about the fact that you don't see nothing. And the more you do that, the more dirt you're piling on it. And the whole time inside, it's growing, but you keep burying it deeper. And you could, now get this, you could actually die in that seed be full grown. You know why? Because it's not through the surface yet. It hasn't come to fruition yet. Now, there was a situation a woman that I know in the states that I was she came to me and she said she had found a lump in her breast assumed it was cancer went to the doctor the doctors looked said yep looks like cancer we're going to do this and we're going to do that and they said you know this is this looks like this fast spreading type cancer so we need to do literally a double mastectomy and she had come to our meetings before that and she said you know pray for us we'll pray okay we'll blast this thing okay now she after that, she went to the doctor, had a double mastectomy performed. After they performed the mastectomy, then they tested the tissue. No cancer. You understand? No cancer. Now, the cancer had been there. The tumor that she felt was, had been there. Now, matter of fact, whenever she went to the doctor, the tumor, she could still feel the tumor. But the difference was, what they found was <clears throat> there was no cancer in her because the tumor was dead. So just because you feel it doesn't mean it's alive. You understand? Sometimes you can feel it and sometimes it can take a while for it to just dissolve and disappear. 
but most people are so full of fear, they don't wait long enough to give it time for it to dissolve, so they get prayer, and then they run and get something done, and then they find out later, I didn't need it done. Over 40% of the things we deal with are fixing mistakes that doctors make. Literally, I, I, I can show you the statistics on that. I can show you the, the things. And it's, a lot of it has to do with fear and has to do with situations. And so, <coughs> my own mother literally had, um, well, she developed lumps, or a lump, I should say, on her breast three different times. <coughs> three different times. Went in, doctors checked her. She said, they said, yep, looks like that's what it is. We're going to go in, we're going to do a biopsy, we're going to check this out, and we're going to do this. Three different times she goes in, they have her prep for surgery. She's sitting on the table waiting for him to come in. And she says, she just says, his father is sitting right. She said, I know you're the healer. I know, I've prayed, I know. And she could, she could literally feel the tumor at that time, feel the, the lump at that point. She said, this is not right. I know I've prayed. I know you're the healer. You've healed me many times before. This isn't right. I don't want them cutting on me. And so she's sitting there, and then she told him, she said, I want you to do another test. And so they did another test. I said, nope, it's still there. We can still see it. And they said, well, you know, we'll, we need to figure out what we're going to do. And she said, well, I'm not going to do it. Well, then they said, okay, well, we, we want to do this and run another test. We're going to try this other thing. And she said, yeah, do this other test. Well, finally, they went through, and when they, she could feel, and they get this, she could feel the tumor. And when they did the, the, the test, it was like an, well, it was an x-ray. When they did the x-ray, they could not see it. They could feel it, but they couldn't see it. Now, and then she said, they, they said, well, we don't want to operate on you until we can verify what this is and that kind of stuff. So when they did a biopsy on it, couldn't find out, it was dead, and she was completely healed, right? She was healed sitting on the table before the surgery. God healed her at that time. Three different times this has happened where she goes in, she goes, God, you, you healed me before. I don't, I, don't, I don't, you know, you need to do it. Well, she's never had surgery, never had any problems. God has healed her every time, you know? Now, <clears throat> the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to realize you cannot, literally, you cannot trust your sight. You can't trust your senses. Now, I'm not telling you to ignore things, you understand? Dealing with them through faith is not ignoring and ignoring is not dealing with it through faith. Thinking you're going to ignore it, that's not faith. Faith is taking the scriptures and applying the power of the word to the situation. Believing God. Amen? Now, <clears throat> in this, the reason I want to get back to this is because I want you to realize when he said, where we are at? Uh, verse 21. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, that is not in the original Greek. Now, let me tell you why it's not in the original Greek. At one point, they came to Jesus and said, why don't you teach your disciples to fast like John taught his? Remember that? And then Jesus said, as long as the bridegroom is with them, they will not fast. Right? Now, in Matthew 17, was the bridegroom still with them? So he could not get on to them for not doing what he told them they didn't have to do. Right? So, and if you look in the, in the Greek, it's not there. Now, you have to realize Jesus did not tell them this. And he wasn't, and, and he answered their question. Why this was added in, I don't know. Unless it was somebody that, had control of the word of God and really wanted to emphasize prayer and fasting and trying to emphasize it as a ritual or, you know, something along those lines. But you can't get on to somebody for not doing what you told them they don't have to do. So whenever he said this, he had, he had already answered the question. They said, why couldn't we do it? And he said, because of your unbelief. Now people say, well, when he said this kind doesn't go out, what was he talking about? Was it, this kind is what? Well, okay, first off, it wasn't there, right? But even if it was there, first off, demons don't leave because you pray and fast, okay? Praying and fasting doesn't cast out demons. Believing does. Now, as a matter of fact, prayer and fasting doesn't even cast out unbelief because that's the other translation or interpretation people do because there are Hindus and 
Muslims and everybody else, they pray and fast, and they're still in unbelief. Amen? So textual criticism, in other words, looking at the text, looking at what was said and comparing that to what has been said, then Jesus could not have, could not have said this to them. Now, the key is you say, okay, but, it, but it's there, there. Well, yeah, but it's in italics, or it should be in your Bible. But the key to remember is this. Regardless of whether that's there or not, whether it's in the Greek or the English or not, which, it, again, it's not in the Greek, but regardless of that, when they said, why could we not do it, he answered and said, because of your unbelief. Now, so forget the part about the praying and, fa- the, the praying. <laughs> the praying and fasting. And just realize that it was unbelief. Now, really when you get down to it, <clears throat> prayer, prayer and fasting is designed to help you die to the things of the flesh. And I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, to... We'll get in this tomorrow. We're going to cover all the basics. And even tomorrow, <clears throat> before we start ministering, I'm going to take you through how to minister. Step one, step two, I'm going to lead you through it, all right? So don't think that you're going to, I'm just going to throw you out there and go, okay, go at it. No, we're going to, you're going to know what to do, okay? <clears throat> and it's going to work for you. Now, the thing is, what I'm trying to get you to first is to understand the principles of it so that when I teach you the specifics and the methods, you won't get hung up on the method and you'll realize that the method I show you is not the end-all method. It's a method to get you started. And once you get started, this is a simple method that everybody can do, and it's biblical. And you might stay with it and do it the rest of your life, and that'll be fine, and it will work. Or, as you start to minister to people, you'll catch yourself doing it a little bit different here and a little bit different there, and by the time I come back, you may have your own method, right? Which is fine, too, as long as it's working and as long as it's biblical. Right? Now, <clears throat> what I was saying earlier is that I, I had some friends that, um, well, this couple, they, they, this man that I knew, he actually, he was he's a man of God, good results, uh, praying for the sick, good results. And he was in a particular state in the United States, and he got a call from this woman and said, I have been diagnosed with breast cancer, and I need prayer. And so he was the closest one to him, so we referred him to her, and, or referred her to him. And he said, okay, where are you at? And she told him, he said, okay, I'll come pray for you. Well, he goes over and prays for her. And so then he sent me the testimony back. And we, I'd heard that the woman was healed, so I'm like, great, okay. So when I get the email of the testimony, he says, <clears throat> I wanted to send you the testimony of how this person got healed. And, I, and so I'm reading it. And he said, so I asked her the situation, found out what it was that she had breast cancer. So I gently placed my hand guess where (laughs) that's why I learned to be very specific and tell people you don't have to put your hand where the problem is okay now so he he said he placed his hand on her breast to pray and see when I'm I'm reading this I'm thinking lawsuit is coming okay (laughs) I can just I can see it well Actually, I was wrong. Actually, what, what came after that was marriage. <laughs> they, um, <clears throat> within a real short time, they were married. And, um, <clears throat> and now they've been married about five or six years now, and they minister together. And any time... <laughs> <clears throat> but any time... <laughs> Anytime somebody contacts us about a missing organ or, you know, a recreative miracle or a creative miracle, as you would call it, I will pray. But I also refer them to this couple because they have a phenomenal track record with organs reappearing, being put back in, being restored. It's amazing, amazing. And they work together as, as this couple, and they're an amazing couple together. Amen? But after that, I learned very quickly, you have to be very specific about what you do. and how to, So I, I'm very specific. So I'm going to teach you how to do this very specifically. All right? <laughs> very, okay. Now, <clears throat> so they, but there's these, you know, there's situations that you go into. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to, to give you this because I want you to realize that some of the, the, the ways that we do things, remember, remember the methods are not sacred, the message is. All right? 
And so you'll find a method that works best for you. Now, we've, we've got testimonies with prayer claws. I mean, that just tremendous things with prayer claws. Uh, Alzheimer has been healed through prayer claws. Uh, dementia, uh, withered arms now operate. One lady wrote, actually, I was on a trip. My wife, uh, she wrote my wife and said, uh, <clears throat> I need a prayer cloth. And they looked and couldn't find any that we had prayed over and left there. So my wife went to my closet, took a perfectly good shirt out and cut the whole sleeve off, the whole sleeve. She didn't just cut a piece of it and send it. She sent the whole sleeve, okay? The lady opens up the box, and you know, the package, and there's a sleeve, okay? And so, yeah, and the amazing thing was, the lady, it was for her, this woman's father who was in a nursing home, and when she, her, her father's arm was withered and wouldn't operate, right? just so happened my wife cut the left sleeve off just so happened it was his left arm so whenever she got the sleeve she went in didn't know what to do so she just put it on his arm and then pinned it to his shirt and so he's sitting there with his arm withered couldn't work it went home told, or told the nurses don't touch that sleeve leave it on the man you know leave it on him <clears throat> she goes next day she comes back in and when she walks in the door she had to look around for him because he's in a day room area and when she found him, she said, she called his name, and he looked at her and waved at her. <laughs> Amen. Now, 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 here's the thing, and that's why I bring this up. I didn't pray over it. It wasn't anointed with oil. It wasn't anything. You understand? But it was a cloth that I had worn. Now, it had been washed, right? It had been sent to the dry cleaners, basically, or, or maybe not dry cleaners, but it had been laundered and pressed. So apparently, you can't wash the anointing out. Okay, okay. Now, we, and, and I mean, this woman, she, my wife didn't know, but yet we got, another man came to a meeting one time. I was leaving, and he ran up and handed me a handkerchief and said, I'm going to visit my dad. He's got Alzheimer's, and would you pray over this? <clears throat> I was trying to think what else. Yeah, there's a couple of things. He said, would you pray over this, and I'm going to take it right to my father right now. I said, yeah, so we prayed over I said, here, I'll show you how to do it, and now you can do it after this. So I took my hands, I put it in my hands, I said, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you, and right now in the name of Jesus, by an act of our faith and of our will. See, your will is important, right? And he said by, by, I said, by an act of our faith and our will, right now, I impregnate this cloth with the very spirit of the living God. Wherever this cloth goes, healing goes. Wherever this cloth goes, deliverance goes. If there is sickness, it must leave. If there are demons, they must flee in Jesus' name. There you go. I gave it to him. He said, okay. Now, again, come on, don't write that down. Use it as a formula, okay? It's not a formula. It's the idea that you are putting life into it. You've got to realize what you have is life. And the beauty of it is the life you have will take the form of any need humanity has. Amen? And so <clears throat> he went, and then we got the testimony later. When he went into the nursing home, his dad was there, had dementia, Alzheimer at that point, and didn't even know they were there. They'd gone in and sat with him, and they didn't, he didn't even recognize them there. And so they went in, and they just tied that around his neck and just let him sit there, and he sat there in, the, in a wheelchair. <clears throat> they said they were watching him, and they were just sitting around like they normally do, but he had no knowledge of, him, of them being there. He was totally gone mentally. And they said they watched him, and all of a sudden, he just started shaking and started shaking really hard, and they were kind of concerned when they thought, oh, this is a new development. This is not good. And they watched him, and all of a sudden, he perked up and said, Jesus, what do you want? And so they're looking around, you know, think, what's he seeing? And he's looking kind of up, not directly in front of him, but kind of up, and he, said, he starts talking to Jesus. And then he bows his head, and the next thing you know, he looks up, looks around and says, when did y'all get here? <laughs> and was completely free, completely free. So that's what I'm saying. We have seen some amazing miracles with, with prayer cloths, <clears throat> things we put under people's pillow. They didn't even know they were there and get healed. I'm telling you, this thing is not psychological. It's not psychosomatic. There is a power. There is a tangibility of the spirit that is alive and that affects the cures that we're talking about. Amen? Yeah, so, I mean, I could go on and on. There's all kinds of stuff like this. Just amazing things. Um, <clears throat> remember the lady I told you about that walked down the hill and walked back up the hill and the other day? If you watch that video on our website, it's funny because I started thinking about this. I get calls all the time to pray for people's animals. 
I'm not kidding. I mean, they call me, you know, my animal's dying. Would you please pray? And I'll be honest with you. I get annoyed at it, okay? Because to me, I mean, I understand, you know, your, your pets are, vi- you know, they're, they're special to you and all that. I don't own any pets. I love animals, okay? Don't get me wrong. I love animals, but my life is not conducive to owning animals, okay? If I owned an animal, it would starve, okay? Because I'd be gone. So I'm not against them. I love them but I just can't own one. But what I don't like to see is when the animals own the owners, all right? My parents had, had well, actually, they still have um, a blue front Amazon parrot, and they've actually got, I think, another one now. They've had this bird for 25 years. Uh, yeah, about 25 years at least. <clears throat> and so it's like part of the family. And, you know, I was an only child, and so... I, we'd go visit their house and this bird when you walk in it starts talking to you I mean my mom taught this bird how to sing Jesus loves me <laughs> and, it, and it'll sing it to you I mean it's amazing well, if they start to go somewhere she'll put it in front of the television and put on the uh, National Geographic channel and it'll, wa- and it'll talk to the birds you know it'll watch the channel and talk to the birds and if, if something funny comes on and the people laugh it will laugh <laughs> when they do and when it laughs it sounds just like my mother <laughs> it does I mean, literally, it takes on her voice. I mean, it's amazing. You can be in the other room and think, is that, is that mom? Is that you know? And, but I started to get, I would get near, and when I come down to visit, I would get near my mother, and when was, if I got too close to my mom, the first, this bird starts saying, that's my mama. That's my mama. <clears throat> and I, I would stand there, and I, and I said, it is not your mama. I said, this is my mama. You're in a cage. I'm out here. I, I mean, I, and then I realized, I'm, I'm arguing with a bird, okay? <laughs> so we're going back and forth. <clears throat> and so, I, you know, me and this bird, we just really don't get along well, okay? <clears throat> and I already told my parents, I said, you know, when y'all die, you better not leave this bird nothing, <laughs> okay? I said, matter of fact, you better leave this bird. I, I already told them, I said, because I would come into town, and I'd say, you know, why don't y'all come up and see us? Because we live about an hour away at that point. And they'd say, well, we, we'd like to, but, you know, it's too hot out or it's too cold out. And we can't get the birds out because, you know, they can't travel that far because it's not good for them. Or it'll get too hot, get too cold, and they'll die. And I'm like, so you're not going to come see me because of a bird. <laughs> I, I've been gone out of country. I hadn't seen you in several months. And you won't come see me because of a bird. And they're like, well, we'd like to. But and I'm like, I'm going to pray that that bird die. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> I just, so I told him, I said, I'm, you watch. I said, I said, we're supposed to have dominion over the animals, not the animals have dominion over us. And I said, so I'm going to pray if that bird dies. I said, you watch. I said, you better hope that that bird dies before y'all do. Because after y'all do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a fried parrot. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to enjoy every bite of it. And I said, okay? And my mom's like, oh, curry, don't you do that. To so... So I told him, I said, you know, I don't like animals keeping y'all from coming to see me. She said, well, I know, you know. And then they, they found these stray dogs that as soon as they brought it home, they started having puppies. And so they, I, I told him, I said, yeah, you know, y'all need to come. I said, well, we got these dogs. They just had puppies. Well, two of them died when they were born. And I mean, as soon as they did, my mom was calling me. She said, Curry, you're not praying against our dogs, are you? That was the first thing. I said, no, I didn't, didn't, didn't know. And she said, well, then, then pray that they come back alive. <laughs> you know? I said, I, I don't know if I can do that. Because you know, so, I, just, I just really don't care to have faith for animals much. I mean, I understand if it's your animal, then <laughs> you have faith for it. Okay? And, and please don't call me because if you're, if you're taking up space on my phone for an animal, there's somebody that can't get through. And that's really the way I look at it. Okay? I had one lady that calls me about every two weeks, about 4 o'clock in the morning. I mean, like clockwork. Uh, her, her cat was dying. Her dog was dying. And then one day, Bigfoot was in her front yard. And I'm not kidding. I'm not, you think I'm not joking. She, she calls and asks me to pray protection because Bigfoot has been in her front yard. And, and I, you know, I, I have her name on my phone. Okay? So I, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I look. It's 4 o'clock. I'm like, hello, Carolyn, where are you from? I mean, because I know it's her. I know it, and I look. Yep, that's her. It's okay. So there you go. And so I'm kind of like, I know this is going to be. And she, now she goes through the obituaries and calls me to pray f- to raise these people from the dead. <laughs> she doesn't even know them. 
It's not like her friend's dying. These are just people that she reads the obituaries for. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, that's why I don't sleep through the night. I get these calls. Okay. Now, I would like to say she's the only one. She's not, okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I was in line one time. See, the people will surprise you. I was in line, going down the line praying for people. And there was this woman standing there. And I'll never forget this because you ever see people, you look at them, if you try to pick out people, you say, I bet they're a school teacher. You're in, you know, they got that look. They got, they got the glasses. They got the, the, the hair in the bun, you know, and you can tell they're just prim and proper and everything is just right. And you say, I know that is a, that's like a grade school teacher. You know what I mean? They're just perfect, you know, as far as a teacher. And, and, and I'm going down the line and I see this person and I get it and I, I'm going down here and I'm praying for people and all kinds of stuff. And I get to this woman and I say, what can I do for you? And she says, I think I have a devil. And I'm thinking, What'd you do? What'd you say, a cuss word? you say a bad word or something? You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not belittling that. I, I don't like cussing. I never have. I've never been a, a cusser even when I wasn't saved. I didn't like it. But come on. You know, you can't picture her being guilty of anything else, you know? That's like the worst thing she could do. So I'm sitting there. I said, okay, what, tell me, what is it? What's, what's the deal? What are you afraid? She goes, well... Every, every full moon, I go out in my backyard and, and jump around and howl at the moon naked. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. That's why she tell. This is a school teacher. Hair in the bun, the glasses, everything. I mean, you couldn't hear anything farther <laughs> from what you would expect. And I'm lo- and see now inside, I'm thinking. You do what? <laughs> Are you nuts? <laughs> you know? that's, what, that's what I'm thinking, you know. <clears throat> and I always turn my microphone off whenever the people are telling me what's going on because it's nobody else's business, right? But, you know, and I got sometimes people hold water for me or something, I'm and I'm, I'm wanting to go, did you hear that? <laughs> you hear what she does? I mean, that's what, I'm, that's what you want to do, you know. But you have to realize this, this is serious to her, right? That way it'd be serious to anybody, okay? <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm surprised her neighbors didn't bring her to the meeting, you know. But I'm standing, and, but you can't show that, you know. Somebody says that, you can't go, what? I mean, you can't, because their hope is in the fact that you know what you're doing. So you can't act like you don't know what you're doing, you know. Even if you don't know, you can't act like it, okay. And so you have to look, and, you, and like with I, what I did with her, I'm standing, I'm like, hear it all the time, let's pray. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Not a problem. Let's go. Yeah. <clears throat> because this, they, they depend on you, right? Now, that's the same. Now, that's kind of a funny situation, but you have to realize it doesn't, it's not always funny. Sometimes you go to the hospital, and when you go in the hospital, you don't know what that's going to be like. You don't know what you're going to walk into. You don't know what it's going to look like. You can't, now listen, I know, and again, it may sound kind of funny, but you can't walk in that door and see this person who is in horrible shape. And you can't look at them and go, good Lord. Okay? I mean, come on. You do that, they could die right then. I mean, because they could just give up hope and go, ah, and that's, they're gone. I, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's not. I mean, I've seen, you would not believe some of the stuff I've seen. And some of the stuff that I've seen God heal. And I mean, if I, I wish. You know, someday they're going to come up with a machine that you can plug in and then project what you've seen onto a machine. You watch. They're going to put it on a screen. Hopefully they won't do it for everything you've seen. But anyway, okay, but, or everything, you know. But they're going to show it on a screen of what you've seen. You watch. Some, sooner or later they'll come up with it out of your memory and you'll be able to think of something and project it. You watch. It's got to be, all right? And so if we can imagine it, it'll happen sooner or later. So, but... I've gone into these people and people that have been literally eaten away with cancer. I've gone into one man's room or one situation where his entire face was gone. I and mean, you could see into his face because of cancer. And, and diseases and demons have a, they all have their own particular smell. And sometimes you can walk into a room and you can smell what demon it is or what disease it is as the case may be. And so I would go in and as I went in, I could, you couldn't hardly hold your, you couldn't hardly even breathe because of the, of the stench of the disease. But you can't walk in there and hold your nose. You know, you can't do that. You, so now I know that whenever I walk up to a room like that, 
I have to stand outside that room because I don't know what it's going to look like. You know, sometimes the things you think are not going to be a big deal are a big deal. And so I stand outside the room, and a lot of times I'll just stop and I'll say, you know what? Jesus, I know that there is nothing on the other side of this door that me and you together can't beat. And so I just gear up, and I walk in, and I do what Jesus would do if he was there. Amen? So you have to go in with that. You can't go in and be surprised. You can't, you would, I have put my hands on people's body in, in goo. I'm, I'm not kidding, in goo, in their body, where their body is dissolving. I put my hands on people that their body is turning into, literally into, into stone. I mean, the, the body hardens up and becomes like a stone. And so I put my hands on that. There was one man that we went that we were, I love praying for people. You know, I mean, I don't love the fact that people are sick, but I love the praying for people and getting, to me, I, you call me and if I can, like when I'm in the States, I have driven over 500 miles out of the way to go pray for somebody. Now, I don't go in and pray three-hour prayers. I go in and pray like I do anywhere else. I'm talking five minutes at the most. Why? Because long prayers don't get any more results and usually get less results than short prayers. You know? Better, better to hit once and hard than just to, uh, you know, pity pat with somebody. Right? And so I go in. <clears throat> I was way up in the north in northern United States and there's people down in Missouri called and said, uh, you know, we need prayer. And so I didn't get to talk to them. It was on my prayer line. So then I got the message and they know if I get the, pray, if I get the message, I'll pray. Doesn't mean I'm going to talk to them, but I will pray about it and God heals them from a distance even if I hadn't talked to them directly. So I had the name of this man. I had his address and all that stuff. So I, I'm up in the northern part and I start to come back down. I thought, you know, that guy's there. And so I knew where the city was. So I just went out of my way and drove down there and it was about a three hour drive out of the way. But this is what I do. You know, I got nothing better to do. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm not busy. I'm just saying there is nothing I could do that would be better than this. That's what I mean. And so I drove by. I show up at these people's house. I knock on the door. They open the door, and they're like, Curry Blake. And I'm like, where? I'm, you know, I just like to mess with people sometimes, you know. And so, but I, I started kind of joking a little bit, and they said, what are you doing here? I said, well, you call for prayer. And they said, well, yeah, but we didn't think you would come here. And I said, well, I was in the neighborhood. Yeah, you know? so I mean, for me, it's a big neighborhood. Okay, so but I said, so here I am, and so I said, can, can I come in and pray? Oh yeah, come in. So I went in. Now this case was a, a situation with this man's foot. He had been, uh, let's see, I'm trying to get the story right. He had been at work. He had a spone, a spone burr. No, he had a bone spur. That's what he had. It wasn't a spone burr. It was a bone spur. Okay. <laughs> So, hey, if God can use Moses, okay. <laughs> now, so we, he went to the doctor to get it cut off. Well, he went into the doctor's office, and they cut the bone spur off. But when he did it, he actually cut a nerve, and it infected. And then it, start, it was a horrible case. I mean, you think something as small as that, and it started setting up infection. And the foot started turning purple on the side. And then it got to where it started spreading up one leg. And they told him, we're going to have to cut off your foot. And they said, if we don't stop it, we're going to have to cut it off at the knee. And if that doesn't stop it, we're going to have to cut it off at the hip. Well, it started going up and going around. And it actually went across the body to the other foot and was going down to the other leg. And what it is, it turned his whole body, his uh, whole lower body, swole up and turned purple. It was horrible looking at. And so on the side of the foot where the bone spur was, it was really bad. I mean, the right, where the spot was, was worse than others. And it had actually started dying. The flesh had started dying. It was turning black. It was starting to rot and starting to peel up. Horrible smell. It was really a bad situation. So we, we go in there, me, me and a friend of mine, he was traveling with me. So we went in <clears throat> and we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. And I said, you know, we want to see this. Uh, you know, let me see it. And the guy had to lie on the couch with his foot out from under the blanket because he could stand nothing on it. If you breathed on it, he would scream. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. And he, had, he would scream because there was so much pain. And I told him, I said, 
you know, let, let, me, let me see the foot. And he said, well, don't, don't, don't touch it. Please don't touch it. I said, oh, I'm, I'm not going to touch it. You know, it's not going to. And then, you know, you say that, and then you want to slack that thing, you know. <clears throat> because, you know, you don't know if it's the devil talking to you. So you know, but I didn't. I was, you know, I told him, I said, I'm not going to touch it, so I didn't touch it. And so, but I got down, I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is horrible. You could see it was like something had bored down into it. And everywhere down into the hole in the foot was just dead. And you could see it just rotting. And so it was runny, it was bad. I mean, it was, it was just bad. And so the, the wife was there, and I said, okay, here's what we're doing. We're going to pray, but before we pray, I said, I don't know how fast this is going to heal. So I told Chuck, as a friend of mine, he was traveling. I said, Chuck, run up to the car, get our camera. I said, do you mind if I take a picture of this? And I said, no, I don't care. So he went out and got the camera, and I brought it back. I said, I want you, I want you to take a picture before we pray, because I might pray, and it might just be gone. So I want a picture before. So he took a picture. We prayed. It didn't disappear. But then I told him, I said, now listen, this, this is going to, and I just started talking to him. It's kind of funny, because it just started coming out. This is going to reverse and go back the same way it came. I said, so it, it will take a little bit of time, but it won't be long, but it's to, you're going to watch it reverse. The same way it grew out, it's going to reverse. And you're going to, now, how did I know that? I don't know, but it was just, I knew it. And so I just, took, you know, I don't know if it, I don't know if God told me that's what was going to happen, or I thought it and said it, and because I said it, that's the way it happened. You understand? And what I'm trying to tell you is, I don't have all this figured out. I don't know what, you know, I don't know what's first, the chicken or the egg. All I know is, it works. Amen? Beauty of it is you don't have to know. I don't know how electricity works. I, don't know how, I do know how to flip on a switch. Amen? So I, I pray for this guy's foot. We leave. And I told him, I said, now listen, as soon as this foot is healed, you take a picture and send it to me. Well, I got back home about a week later. About a day after that, I got a package in the mail. <clears throat> Open it up. Here's a picture of a perfect foot. <laughs> perfect foot. Amen? The man did not lose his foot. He didn't lose his ankle, didn't lose his, you know, leg, hip, nothing. I mean, it just, and the lady wrote the letter and said, it was amazing. We watched this thing reverse just like you said it would. I mean, I'm telling you, I could tell you so many, I could be here for weeks telling you testimonies. I'm telling you, this stuff works, it works, and all you, but you've got to work it. Now, when we started, we didn't see the pizzazz, you know, we didn't, it was just, <clears throat> we didn't see that stuff. We just faithfully went after it and started laying hands on the sick and commanding them to be healed, and it was what we believed that counted. Amen?